You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we're live, but everybody knows the drill. We've got to let the screen breathe just for a couple of seconds to make sure we're nice and stable, to make sure we've got five beautiful check marks and that we got Facebook online and we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we are now, you know, a day removed, 24 hours removed from the Broncos' massive upset win over the nine-point favorite Patriots at Gillette Stadium. This is the aftermath episode, as is tradition, where we kind of pick up the pieces and sift through and, and really try and find the more, um, you know, the, the real takeaways here to sink our teeth into. How are you feeling about the Broncos win and where this team goes coming out of week six? I'm feeling the same as I did yesterday. I'm very happy the Broncos won. I wish they wouldn't have made it so close. I don't understand the pushback against Drew Locke and the, and the hate and criticism he's receiving for getting a victory. Um, and I'm encouraged because I just watched the Kansas City Chiefs hold off the Buffalo Bills in a driving rainstorm. I watched that game with one thing in mind, Chad. If the Broncos can play the same level of defense they played against the Patriots, they can take down the Kansas City Chiefs. Not saying it's going to happen, but I'm feeling way more encouraged about the Broncos' offense, about the Broncos' defense, about the Broncos' coaching than I did even two, three weeks ago. I like where they're heading. It doesn't mean uh, they're going to be playoff contenders. It doesn't mean they're going to to challenge for a trophy this year. It just means they're looking better and getting better. And if they can just build off this momentum, I think you're going to see a lot of success in the second half of the season. Whereas, again, two weeks ago, people were thinking number one overall draft pick, you know, one fifteen, two and fourteen record. The Broncos are a lot better than people have or will give them credit for, including from within their own fan base. That's what I don't understand, Chad. I'm still a little perplexed as to a fan base that's been starved of a success, starved of good quarterback play. You got both yesterday, no matter the interceptions, and you're pushing back against it. You know, you're stepping over dollars to pick up quarters. Be happy with a victory. Be happy the Broncos have a winning streak now. Be happy Drew Locke's back under center. He is your potential franchise quarterback, and Broncos country needs to embrace him instead of nitpicking and criticizing every little mistake that is perceived he makes. I think there's two things at work here. One, I think that when Drew Locke got hurt again so quickly, after all the optimism and coming off a rookie campaign in which you know he missed so much time because of an injury, to get hurt again to miss time in week two, I think a lot of fans, and again this vote, this minority of fans that is has been outspoken in their in their criticism of of Locke and whatnot coming out of week six, it's a small fraction of Broncos country. Most Broncos fans are stoked, but I think those fans that are feeling the way that they are, it stems from the fact that. They got so disappointed in that injury and the fact that he had to miss time again that now there's almost an emotional block that's not allowing them to get invested again. They don't want to get invested again. They don't want to put themselves out there again. Under I know I'm going way down the rabbit hole here with you know some Freudian uh, you know reading into things maybe perhaps a little a little too much. However, and then the other thing at work here with Drew Locke is the fact that I think fans he was gone long enough that fans kind of you know they they some of them anyway got accustomed to the idea of life without Drew and what it might look like with someone else, like a Trevor Lawrence, et cetera. And all I can say is Zach and I have been here the entire time trying to keep this thing in perspective for everybody. And the fact that Drew Locke was coming back, what was the phrase we kept using? It's not like he got hit by a bus, right? And when he came back, he came back with a plump. Zach, I went back and watched the L22 film because it was available today. And those this dude dropped dimes, okay? The, dropped dimes in the first half, all the way through the third quarter, and until that awkward, weird sequence of of snaps that we'll get to in the fourth quarter here in a little bit, we'll talk more about it. He was playing well. He just he didn't have a great collective performance from his receivers. So I don't fully understand the Drew Lock hate Zach. The only thing I can I can really chalk it up to is just that minority of fans who ha- were so disappointed in losing him that now they don't dare to get back on the train again because they're worried they're going to get 
crushed back down to, your, to earth again if he gets hurt again. Or the ones who are never really Drew Lock supporters. You can always weed out the casual fans from the hardcore fans. And how do I put this delicately? Broncos, a, a sect of Broncos country needs to stop figuratively cutting their wrists and looking for every bad thing and being depressed over a win. The Broncos emerged victorious. They upset the Patriots. The, Drew Locke made enough plays in that game to let the Broncos, to put them in position for the Broncos to win. He got McManus into field goal range for McManus to help the Broncos win. He threw enough passes, like Chad just mentioned, to help the Broncos win. I will. I am the last person to pull the what-if card. It's a, how it should have been, could have been, but... In a normal situation, if his receivers could catch, if the play calling was a little more in tune, he would have had 300-plus yards and three touchdowns in a blowout victory. And if that would have happened, which it easily could have and should have, we would be hailing, all of us would be hailing Drew Locke right now as the savior. And you would hear no complaints. You'd hear nothing of Trevor Lawrence, nothing of Justin Herbert. It'd be all Drew Locke like it was coming into this season. And this is the fickle nature of the Broncos fan base and NFL fans and Sports fans, it's a player is the hot commodity for the 15 minutes, and then once those 15 minutes are up, literally as soon as it's 15.01, it's on to the next. What have you done for me lately? What else you got? And Drew Locke, he was the savior. He was the best quarterback the Broncos have had since Peyton Manning coming into the year. He injures his shoulder through no fault of his own, and Broncos fans are jumping off the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. For what reason? He comes in, the Broncos looked hapless while he was gone. The Broncos, he comes back, the Broncos upset the Patriots. And and fans are pushing back against that. Be happy with what you have right now. And it's still a decimated Broncos team, a young Broncos team going through transition and, and all these upheaval and battles. And you still upset the Patriots. You still have a two-game winning streak. And guess what? You have a chance now to upend your hated division rival, Kansas City Chiefs, in Denver, Three-game winning streak, and then by that point, if that happens, it's a whole new season, and no one is going to want to face the Broncos and Drew Locke. I don't want to paint with too broad of strokes here because it's not, again, it's not a majority of Broncos fans. I don't want everybody listening to this feeling like we're, we're jumping on you because it really is a minority of fans that have, have been ultra-negative coming out of this win. But it's always that vocal minority that, you know, tends to – screw things up, right? That ends up garnering notice, I guess, is, is an attention. And that's really what this is, what we're talking about here is maybe it's just social media and the nature of social media, vaults, these type of things. Guys, I don't know how well you can see this. Let me see. Zach, tell me if this improves because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on over here. Everybody knows a uh, Angel. He's, he's a superstar in the community. He goes by AO350 Legend. He had a nice screen grab that he shared on Twitter today. How well can you see that? Can you, can you make yeah. it out? All right. Let me just remind everybody. All right. These are three, uh, excuse me, four quintessential drops that illustrate the dimes Drew Locke threw in this game and the money left on the table. All right. The opportunities that were missed. You can see the two to Albert O. All right. And it actually is missing one from Albert O. There was also the one, the first one down the left sideline. So three to Albert O that he dropped in the end zone. Okay. We could be talking about Albert O in his debut as a Bronco catching three touchdowns. Then you got the Jerry Judy one, which was a perfect pass. Not an easy play to make, but a perfect pass, perfect ball placement. Jerry Judy's got to make that play. And then, of course, you got Deshaun Hamilton where, you know what, if he catches this, a perfectly thrown ball going against a number one corner, arguably the number one corner in the league, fearlessly, perfectly placed. If Deshaun Hamilton does catch that, there's a good chance he waltzes all the way in. If yep. not, he ta gets tackled or out of bounds. It's a 40, 50 yard gain. Okay. And this, this tweet really illustrated it. Shout out to Angel, his Twitter account, A, it's at AO350 legend. Give him a follow. He's a great Twitter uh, follow. And then also, uh, RK, Ryan Koningsberg of uh, the DNVR, Zach had a really good tweet today that I want to, I just want to draw some attention to. In fact, let me, uh, let me, let me show you guys this so you can, you can read along with this because it illustrates also, what, how collectively things were left on the table. So Konigsberg says, I went to the film to calculate Drew Locke's actual potential stat line. And I understand ifs and buts, candy and nuts, right? Woulda, shoulda, coulda. But through no fault of Drew's, all right, here's what could have been. Drew Locke's actual potential stat line, if you take away the four big drops, biggest drops from his wide receivers, he would have finished 14 to 21. 268 yards, three touchdowns, no picks. In this case, even if you only give them a field goal on the Hamilton drop, 
the Broncos would have scored 33 points, and they're not throwing probably those two passes uh, in the fourth quarter. Now, that being said, Zach, it is the NFL. You can't cry over spilled milk. But I only il- I only show these things to illustrate that Locke played really well. It's those three plays, the, the mishandled snap, the first interception, which he and the coaches admit was on Locke, actually, and then, of course, the second pick. So people need to appreciate what he did and build confidence off that, knowing that, man, you've all things are possible now that you got Locke back under, under center. Yeah, that tweet illustrated the same exact point I made yesterday. If if things could have happened as they should have, he would have had a, a huge game, and he would have been the reason why the Broncos had a blowout victory, not just eat past the Patriots. And it, it doesn't always go that way in the NFL. Things happen the way things happen, but the box score never tells the full story. It doesn't even tell the cliff notes. You really have to watch the game. You have to know who you're watching, and you have to take everything into consideration. When he drops a perfect dime, and it hits Deshaun Hamilton's chest, not his hands, his chest, and it bounces off of him, that's not Drew Locke's fault. When he throws a heater to Alberto in the end zone, it goes through Alberto's hands. That's not Drew Locke's fault. Jerry Judy dropping it. It's not Drew Locke's fault. Was he perfect yesterday? Absolutely not. He has a a long way to go in his development still, Chad. You and I are two of the the first to say that, but he played like a true starting caliber potential franchise quarterback yesterday against one of the best defenses in the NFL and arguably the best defensive mind of this generation in the entire sport of football. And coming off an injury like that to his throwing shoulder, Coming on cold again, not having his number one tight end, not having his number one running back, not having his number one right wide receiver. He can throw for a theoretical, let's say, 300 yards and three touchdowns. And the Broncos win 30 to, to 14, or let's say. W- what are you complaining about? If, if you watch that game and you understand football and you understand Drew Locke and the Broncos offense, not only where they are now, but where they've been in recent years, how could you come off disappointed? How could you not be encouraged that the Broncos have momentum and facing a Kansas City team up next in Denver that's very, just like the Patriots, I'll use the same word, beatable completely. Shout out to Bison M jumping in with the super chat. Really appreciate it. He says, love three's confidence and poise. He's got the tools. Concur, yes. my friend. And this one as well. He says, pay Shelby. Simple. Love this podcast. Really appreciate that, Bison. We'll get to the Shelby thing more here in just a few minutes and your questions and whatever topics you guys want to get to here, including what Vic Fangio had to say today um, at Broncos HQ and his presser. But first, we got to handle a couple of quick matters of business, guys. Tonight's live stream pod brought to you by sportsbetting.com. Right now, gambling is legal in the state of Colorado. And what makes sportsbetting.com a no-brainer for sports fans is the fact that you get sharp odds, low juice, hassle-free bonuses, which you can roll over once and after one time, and you get 24-7 live customer support, which is always a real person in the U.S. of A. And the kicker, though, this is something everyone should pay close attention to. At sportsbetting.com, you can get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to 500 bucks, And it's not just one bet, all of your bets Play for a week. If your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com will cover 100% of the difference up to 500 bucks. And of course, you can roll that over one time. So head on over to sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle. That's sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle. Capitalize on a risk free week of sports betting up to 500 bucks and support the sponsors that support. Mile high huddle. All right, a couple other quick things, and then since our opening segment ran a little bit long, a couple of quick things, matters of business, then we'll dive right back in. Follow the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Follow the main account on Twitter, at HuddleUp, or excuse me, at Mile High Huddle. And then head on over to HuddleUpPod.com if you are in a position to, and get your swag on. Get a hat, get a T-shirt, get a mug, get a face mask. It's another way that you can support what we are doing here on the Huddle Up Podcast and at MHH overall. And then shout out, um, to our Facebook supporters, we love you. If you're on Facebook and you would like to support the cause here, what we're doing at MHH, just go to facebook.com slash mile high huddle. You'll see the big blue button to become a supporter. Click that. You're in like Flynn. We are working now. In fact, we're putting some things in place to provide specific content, live streams, film breakdowns only to the supporters on Facebook. So that's going to be coming down the pike. And guys, if you're not in a position to patronize the merch store or become a supporter, it's all good. Whether you're with us live right now, we love each one of you. Or after the fact is a podcast on demand. All of you can do these three things, and they're crucial. Subscribe, like this video, really key on YouTube and Facebook. And the best testimonial, you guys hear us say this often, if you think Zach and I are doing a good job, the best testimonial, share this video, share the podcast, 
Share it out there. It is the best way to help us grow and continue to reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. And, Zach, shout out to our, our community continues to grow. We crossed the 8,000 subscriber mark, I think it was today or last night overnight. So uh, congrats to you, congrats to me, congrats to the community and everybody, and welcome to all our new subscribers. And thank you guys very much. Really appreciate you. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Broncos country, who would have ever guessed that saving the world, making a difference, saving America's rivers would have been as easy as kicking back with your favorite Coors Seltzer? Listen up. Coors Seltzer is launching the world's easiest volunteer program. So whatever you're doing, the way it works is by simply cracking open a can of Coors Seltzer, you are volunteering. And here's why that's important. Our waterways are currently at risk, gang. And you all know that. 80% of America's rivers, believe it or not, are drying up. Through a partnership with Change the Course, Coors Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. The way it works is each 12-pack of Coors Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. And the result? 1 billion gallons of water restored to 16 river basins across the United States, including the Colorado River. And that's just year one. And what's great about Coors Seltzer is it comes in four refreshing flavors, and it's one cool cause. Enjoy naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. And the specs are in, gang. Coors Seltzer is 4.5% ABV and only 90 calories. Wow, Chad. Watching the ups and downs of the Broncos upset over the Patriots was thrilling enough. But having my core seltzer in hand made it an unforgettable and refreshing experience that I won't soon forget. Well said, my friend. So join the world's easiest volunteer program by simply drinking Coors Seltzer. You, yes, you can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Coors Seltzer, you help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. It's that simple. So visit CoorsSeltzer.com and find a Coors Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12-pack sold through 831-2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. All right, Zach, let's, uh, let's grab a couple of these. So the idea of paying Shelby, we'll come back to some of the Drew stuff and maybe talk more about the uh, sequence in the fourth quarter and kind of what led to that. But the idea of getting out in front of paying Shelby, Zach, there's been a few, there's a couple of players I think right now that the Broncos would be wise to uh, tender an offer to get out in front of that early. Garrett Bowles, Shelby Harris, in my mind, those two rise above in terms of priority. I got two more. Philip Lindsay to me, he deserves to be paid, and I'm going to pay Tim Patrick as well. And I said this on yesterday's pod. I understand the Broncos' investment. They took two receivers this year. Cortland Sutton's contract is coming up. But if if the Broncos had 10 more Tim Patricks on offense, they'd be much better off. The guy is a gamer. He's a baller. He's Cortland Sutton light. He has unbelievable chemistry with Drew Locke, unbelievably amazing sure hands. Those are the three guys that jump in, out to me in and, and mind. Uh, to me, Shelby Harris, far and away, he, he got to prove a deal. He's proven it. He's proven now in the NFL. He's proven with the Broncos. Give him his long-term contract. He is your future at the defensive end position, along with Mike Purcell, who they have now in tow for the next foreseeable future. That's a good nucleus to build on. You add in Draymond, Draymond Jones in there. Maybe Gerald Casey comes back next year to add a little more. I'm paying Shelby Harris first. And then it's crazy to say, I can't believe I'm actually about to say this sentence. I would actually pay Garrett Bowles a long-term contract real quick Christian who he wants to know thank you for the super chat who uh who passed away in my family it was my grandmother last week she she passed away so thanks my friend appreciate it uh he says if fans can't love then they're not real fans and should cheer for another team hashtag real fans only and yeah I mean guys you wandered the quarterback desert for five years and those of you who are complaining like this cat right here Ruben doc get off my porch. Okay. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Did you not hear anything we just said in the first segment, dude, the dimes, the drops. All right. Let's say at, at no point, first and foremost, Zach, did we say Drew Locke was a perfect passer, but in that from- half especially, okay. There were no obvious misfires. There were no wildly inaccurate throws. They were dimes. And guess what, Zach, they were vertical dimes and they were dimes that should have been stacked in the bank Payday, pay dirt, touchdowns, three of them that should have been. Okay. So, Ruben, yes, does, on the stat sheet, if you're going straight off a box score, my dog, 
get off my porch, dude. I'm serious. Like, I'm not even going to listen to that. That's just ridiculous, bro. You're not even paying attention to to the to what we're trying to tell you. And you obviously didn't watch the film. Go back, watch the film, and then holler. Now, you want to talk fourth quarter and be critical of Drew Lock? I'm ready for that. We can talk about that, and I'll I'll meet you there. But this that's just a ridiculous premise. Yeah, you can always separate the box score watchers from the fans who actually watch the game, and the former don't really know what they're talking about. And no offense, Ruben, but that's just a very lazy take that you're going to throw out there. It very easily could have been 300 yards and in 60% completion percentage if his receivers could catch the football. And to your point, Chad, Broncos fans, all of us, media analyst fans, have wandered the desert with the Broncos looking for that quarterback. We finally found water, and some Broncos fans are complaining that it's Aquafina and not Zephyr Hills. Be happy with the quarterback that you have. Be happy with what Locke is producing for you. It's his first start back from a shoulder injury with a less than 100% offense. But to anyone still doubting, I have three more words that everyone's familiar with. Let them hate. Jeff C., superstar, jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. He says... Zach can say whatever, but Locke needs to read and scan the field better. Bad Said habits it yesterday. continue. DB, uh, Denver Broncos have the most drops in the NFL. Jerry Judy seems soft at the NFL level. Yeah, Jerry Judy's still coming along. But but to his point about Locke reading the field, guys, let me remind you of something real quick, okay? That was Drew Locke's eighth career start in the league, my dog, okay? What you saw in the fourth quarter especially – and it comes down to reading the field, too, and sometimes missing uh, open receivers. It's the plight of a young quarterback, dude. It's it's You charge it to the game. It's the way it goes. It's how they learn. It's how they develop. And if anything right now, what Drew Locke needs to be better at is he needs to become a better game manager. And he didn't get a lot of help from his coaches in the fourth quarter, protecting that multi-score lead. The first pick, that was completely on him for uh, having a miscue with Tim Patrick. He saw the blitz. Quarterbacks throw the back shoulder often. They have that route when they see the blitz they throw the back shoulder it was a miscue with Patrick and the DB capitalized on Patrick not realizing he was going to do that the second pick it's inexcusable but it's also on 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 uh, Pat Shermer and I think honestly Zach it was that that botch snap that he fumbled got him into a little funk the pick then the other pick and now everyone wants to throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah, eight career starts, and, and he's been, if you throw out the Pittsburgh game, which I'm doing, he's 5-2, and two, and he's shown that he can win with his arm talent, his leadership, his intangibles. It's, again, he's not a franchise quarterback. He's not a ready-made product yet. He's still baking in the oven, but all the ingredients are there. The recipe is there, and if the Broncos marinate it correctly and handle it correctly, he will develop into and he will come out of that proverbial oven as a franchise quarterback. But you know what? fans can nitpick all I want with the coaching and the way the game flow went yesterday and him coming off a shoulder injury. They have a very leaky Kansas City defense in front of them, the Broncos and Drew Locke. I expect him to come out, and he's seeing all this as well, Drew. He's, he'll never say it publicly, but he's seeing criticism he's getting in his first game back, and he led them to an upset of the Patriots. I cannot wait to see what he's going to do. Back in Denver, his first game back in front of Broncos, some Broncos fans, against a division rival who's very beatable this year and a leaky Kansas City defense. If Broncos fans weren't convinced against the Patriots, they will be convinced against the Kansas City Chiefs. He will end this year convincing a lot more people than leaving you know questions behind as to his status about the long-term solution to the Broncos quarterback position. And guys, eighth career start, like Zach said, you know, you, you hate crediting week two. Uh, to the Pittsburgh game to him, but he did start the game, so it goes on his resume. Eighth career start, all right? And he becomes the youngest quarterback in the history of Gillette Stadium to win at Gillette Stadium. He's the youngest quarterback ever to to win in Gillette Stadium. Now, how far back does that go? 2 Gillette Stadium opened for the 2 season. So, um, sorry, John. Uh, Royal was next. I got to grab that one from WE. I don't know. I can't go back up and grab it now. I don't know if you have it somewhere else. If not, I can just read it. WE, you guys saw that sitting there. Let me grab it here. It says, if Fant and MG uh, Melvin Gordon play, we win this game. He's talking about uh, the Patriots game, 30-12. to Locke goes for 350. Let's not forget they've accounted for two-thirds of our touchdowns, talking about Fant and Gordon. Locke would have had a box line. Appreciate that, WE. And, yeah, I mean – it is what it is. It is what it is, guys. Like, give the kid is give him and the team for what it's worth, the credit they deserve. Even the national media, all of whom got it wrong, no one picked him. Okay, even they are making excuses for 
the Patriots. Oh man, the Patriots, no practice. Oh man, Cam Newton coming back I, off the bug that shall go unmentioned. And oh man, all these obstacles that Bill Belichick's had to overcome. What about the Broncos? You don't think the Broncos have had their more than their fair share of a bad turn at the wheel here of karma? The football gods have not been kind to the Broncos. Give them their credit, Zach. I had one Patriots fan in my Twitter uh, replies yesterday. He said, calm down. You beat a Patriots team that's twice as hindered as your own. And I said, says the guy who would have bragged about the Patriots beating a hindered Broncos team with Cam Newton coming back. There's nothing quite as salty as New England tears. And I love evoking them. It brings me actual happiness. But I don't care what the score would have been, 30 to 12 or what the game ended up being. A win is a win is a win in the NFL. And the Broncos emerge victorious. You can play the what if game if they had Sutton if they had Melvin Gordon, if Locke had a better stat line, a win is a win. It doesn't matter. So that's what the overarching point that I think we're both trying to make here. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Royal jumping in on Super Chat. Really appreciate you, my friend. Thank Thank you. you. He says, do you guys think this could be Jerry Judy's breakout game? If not this week, then what game would you hope for in the upcoming weeks? You know, how do you determine what makes a breakout caliber matchup. I don't, I don't think there's anything per se on the schedule where you go, look, this is the game for Judy. I think for Judy, he just has to, he just has to put it all together, dude. I still think he's living too much in his head. He's not just being himself. He's not just relaxed out there, being the man, being focused. And I don't know what has caused him to be so off his game. And maybe it's just the NFL speed. Um, Maybe it's this feeling that when Sutton went down, he had to be the man. But, Zach, I got news for you. If you're Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick's the man, not you. Right. You need to step your game up. You you should be Mr. Number uh, 15 overall pick, Mr. Jerry uh, Judy, SEC, Alabama national champion. You should be the man. And Tim Patrick, a guy who went undrafted out of Utah three, four years ago, he's outshining you. Yeah, he's got more veteran experience in terms of the league, but how many – Scouts, how many draft nicks are going to tell you with a straight face, Zach, that Tim Patrick is a more gifted, naturally gifted wide receiver than Jerry Zero. Judy? None. Yeah. So it's between the ears. And until he settles down and kind of, you know, and I think having Drew Locke, the same quarterback for a few games, might yeah. help this kid a little bit. So let's let's see how he steadies out with Drew Locke, you know, hopefully remaining under center. It's the same point I made when Judy had his, his his drop issues the first couple of weeks. He was treated as the guy. He was a very big fish in a small pond at Alabama. He rarely lost. He was the number one wide receiver in the best one of the best offenses in all of college football. He comes to Denver where he's beneath Cortland Sutton in a very young offense on a very unproven team, and he struggles with drop issues and criticism. You have some Broncos fans thinking, should we have drafted C.D. Lamb? Should we have drafted another receiver or another player in the first round? Those are premature. But Jerry Judy, to his defense, was never – intended to be the number one wide receiver this season. That was supposed to be Cortland Sutton. He was supposed to be relaxing, to use your word, Chad, and to be comfortable in the wide receiver two role. That's where he needs to be in his rookie year. Keeping that responsibility on him and all the pressure of being the top receiver. And when you mention an offense, it's on its third quarterback already. So have some consistency. The Broncos are still finding themselves. I'm sure a lot of it is mental. The criticism, the speed of the game, it's a transition, even for a polished prospect like Jerry Judy. But he's still shown flashes. His route running, he mossed a defensive back. He's electric on the field. He he will be better as time goes along. It's too knee-jerk to say the Broncos wasted a pick or he's a bust. Give him time. The longer Locke is under center, the the better Jerry Judy will be. Dylan Bryant jumping in with a super chat. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Name I don't recognize on super chat. So welcome and thank you, Dylan. Make sure if you are one of our newer super chat superstars that you do connect and reach out with Zach and I on Twitter because we love shouting out our superstars after each show. He says, I agree completely. Drew Locke played better than he got credit for and looked better than the box score showed. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, Zach, you hear people say, uh, you know, we, we, we rue the, the box score scout. And it's easy, man, to go, hey, let's see how this player did. I'm going to check the box score. Maybe that's the first thing you look at if you miss the game, okay? But then if you see the box score and you're like, mm, you know, something doesn't add up or, whoa, Drew Lock was sub-50% completion, Zach. Maybe I need to turn on the tape and see what was going on. Right. I assume, and I, and I already forgot dude's name, but I assume people like that that I had to get a little bit uh, rough with here. I assume they watched the game. What did you miss, dog? 
Like, seriously, what did you miss from that game that would make you say Drew Locke was not dropping dimes, all right? He threw two picks. What would your feedback be coming out of that game if those two picks don't happen and the Broncos win by uh, right. 12 points? I, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to know. I mean, you're thinking he he played a pretty good game, and it, I it's human nature. If you look at a box score, you see he went 10 for 20 and threw two picks, it, it, under 50% completion percentage, no touchdowns. It doesn't look great for Drew Locke on paper, but you have to watch the game to see how it unfolded. It, it's it's so maddening because we can't literally prove this, Chad. This is all hypothetical, but he w- would have been very easily 300-plus yards and three or more touchdowns in a no-doubt-about-it Broncos blowout. And we're not even having this conversation. But I'm encouraged because he has that ability. He showed it yesterday in his first game back, and he will show it, leaving no doubt about it. He will put those stats in the box score. And then those Broncos fans that are still you know, hemming and hawing and, and you know, clutching their pearls over Drew Locke, that's not going to happen any longer. Let them hate on Drew Locke because they will come around and see, just like the national media, just like the uninformed, they will all come around on number three. I want to grab this question, this super from Jason here, and then I want to read what Vic Fangio had to say about Drew Locke's performance after watching the tape on the flight home. Jason Christopher, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Your support means a lot to us. I hope you know that. He says, should the coaching staff bench Deshaun Hamilton in favor of the rookie Seventh round pick Tyree Cleveland. Zach, I'm ready for it. I don't want to see any more Hamilton. How about you? I'm willing to bench him for anyone. He he doesn't bring anything to the offense, Deshaun Hamilton. And a lot like Nick Vanette, there's just players that take up space on the roster. And if you take them off the field, you're actually gaining from not having their presence out there. So yeah, Tyree Cleveland, uh, when KJ Hamler does come back either this week or next week, I think if he doesn't go on IR, he will take some of those receiver reps. But yeah, Deshaun has worn out his welcome. That happened, I think, a year ago. And it's beyond proven now after that that mishandled catch yesterday that he's just no good for this team. All right, so we're going to grab Zeus McPeak's Super Chat here next. But first, I want to read this quote. This was Vic Fangio. What did you like? What did you see from Drew Locke's performance against the Patriots? Quote, this is today. I thought Drew played well yesterday. The big thing I was looking for with him was to see if he looked like a guy who was nursing an injury and playing through it. And I didn't see that at all. Neither did I, for what it's worth. I saw a guy that was out there looking normal into the game. And a guy that you would have no clue he was getting his first action since getting hurt about a month ago. That part was a big thing for me in regards to the throws in the fourth quarter, talking about the picks and whatnot. Obviously, there's a throw or two that he would like to have back. We were trying to be aggressive. We were trying to make first downs. We'll analyze that and see if it was the right choice. Not so much run or pass, but where we were throwing it and how we were throwing it. Close quote. So, Zach, Fangio was really worried that he was going to play – kind of in a shell, kind of protecting himself, not be loose, natural, have his full physical, you know, wherewithal, and also playing a little bit shy, so to speak. That's definitely not what Fangio saw, and that should be what anyone else saw because he didn't play like that at all. Chad, his first pass of the game was a 41 year old, year old, 41 year old yard bomb to Tim Patrick. I've been writing too many articles with uh, numbers and you know what I'm talking about, Chad. Yep. Um, so yeah, he showed time and again yesterday, he was uncorking balls down the field. And I even tweeted, looks like his arm is just fine. And he took a shot, landed right on his shoulder. And I, I tweeted this out there, said it on yesterday's pod popped right back up after taking that shot. The next play after that hit, he throws a dime down the sideline. I can't recall the play. Perfect pass. So he didn't play like a scared, tentative quarterback. He could have easily went into his shell, been a game manager, seen happy feet in the pocket, ghost to quote Sam Darnold. None of that, Chad. He was unfazed. He was the normal Drew Locke, and he's only going to get better. If that was the bad Drew Locke and they still won that game, can you imagine how good they're going to be when we get good Drew Locke? Mm -hmm. When you get experienced, Drew Locke. And again, I remind everybody, that was his eighth career start. Bill Belichick never loses to a quarterback in his first eight starts. It's, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure if it's ever happened, you know. (laughs) They went went into New England and beat the Patriots. Why aren't Broncos fans ecstatic about this? Like Zeus says, appreciate you, Zeus. Love you, buddy. Appreciate the support. MHH Mount Rushmore, first face etched up there. Didn't look pretty, but a win is a win. The Broncos can build off of that. There is so much they can build off of this game. They dominated the trenches on both sides of the ball. Philip Lindsay went over 100 yards. They controlled the rushing game. The Patriots went into that game rushing for 180 a, a game. And until uh, uh, Cam Newton, on those last two Patriots possessions, rushed for about 70-something yards, 
they had stuffed this Patriots' number one rushing attack, held them to like 60 yards. All right. It took some garbage time, backyard playmaking type stuff from Cam Newton to even get them over 100 yards rushing as a team. There is so much this team can build on going into week seven, coming off of such a win like this. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase what I said. They didn't beat New England. They dominated New England from start till almost finished. You can argue that the last three minutes got a little sloppy, got a little scary. We were all clenching a little bit, but they still, for 57 minutes straight, you can easily make the case that Vic Fangio outcoached Bill Belichick. How freaking cool is that? And I've been a big Vic Fangio critic this season. He went into New England with a proper game plan, had the Broncos ready to play, and even the Broncos offense. Uh, You can argue that they got the best of McDaniels. All around, the Broncos were the better team yesterday. They were outclassing New England in Foxborough. And with a quarterback who hasn't played in a couple weeks, how any Broncos fan isn't encouraged, I still don't. I can't even fathom it yet. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, it does boggle the mind, seriously. It's like, are you a Broncos fan or not? Like, what planet are you on? Glenn Hauser, everyone knows Glenn, owner of the uh, most awesome. There was was one other that might compete, but still, I got to give the nod to Glenn. Bronco man cave of all time, superstar. Love you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. He says, every pass was a bomb. Loved it. For the naysayers, I found that those who yell the loudest don't have much important to say. Very hashtag true. MHH, hashtag lock. Well said, Glenn. Um, also, we got one here coming in from Chad04, the Chad04. Very cool name, but it's just a super chat in the comment. Appreciate that, my friend. Really do appreciate your support, Chad. Uh, make sure you reach out, connect with us on social media. Dave from Georgia, good to see you, my friend. Always you, back in the stream. Appreciate the super chat, a bona fide superstar. He says, Locks played eight games. Time and practice will fix any problems. This team is going to be dangerous once the young kids get on the same page. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. And Zach, there's so much truth to that. This was something I wrote about a couple of different times last night in the kind of post-game analysis and on a video. And we talked about it on the live stream that all things are possible for any NFL team when you have your quarterback. And Drew Locke is the quarterback. You heard Brett Rippon say it coming out of that week four win. He led the Broncos to a Scrappy win against the the Jets, and he came out on that saying, whoa, 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 no, 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 this is Drew Locke's team. It is Drew Locke's team. And the fans that are still a little sensitive and still a little, you know, um, a little scared to hope and get behind Locke, why are you a fan? Fans about being hope. It's like, you know, get behind your guy. If if I would understand if he was completely sucking it up. I would understand if he was completely uh, coming short of expectations and disappointing but he's not, all right? He was very impressive for the majority of that game. Geo Vandermark in the house. George, it's so good to see you, my friend. Uh, this is a guy that is battling his rear end off, trying to fully vanquish the most virulent of bugs. We all know what we're talking about here, the C and the V. George has been battling that. Our thoughts, our prayers have gone out to you, my friend, and I hope you're you're doing better. It sounds like you're doing at least modestly better, and it's great to have you in the stream, my friend. And he says, Albert O was a beast. You know, I don't know if I would quite go so far as to say a beast. If he catches all three of those touchdowns, I'm right (laughs) with you, George. But he definitely made an impression, Zach. And the impression on me was this is a coaching staff that would be in dereliction of duty if they were to go any more games this year without dressing and utilizing Albert Okaway Boonham in this game plan. Yes, very well said, and you can argue that they it'd be a dereliction of duty not to cut Nick Vanette and to give Alberto every single one of his reps that he would have gotten. He looked better to me than I anticipated. I always knew he'd be a speedster, a red zone target, but he has some physicality to his game too. He broke a couple tackles, he looked strong out there, and it just makes you salivate to think what he can do paired in tandem with Noah Fant, which we might get Sunday against the Kansas City Chiefs. He's a good player, he will be a potentially great player for this offense, just Lock down those hands. You know, you can't draw passes in the end zone. I, I know it's your first game. I know it's it was a very hard pass to catch, but you got both hands on it. You got to bring it in. If he does that, then yeah, he was a beast. But he had beastly flashes yesterday, I would say. Here's what Fangio said, and then we'll grab this super on Albert Okaway Boonham against the Patriots. Quote, I was pleased with some of Albert's play yesterday. He made two nice catches and ran with it well after. I think it was a good first outing for him and is something that he can build upon. There are some other plays that he would like to have over. 
I'd like to see him come up with one or two of those balls that were thrown his way. He's talking about the end zone. But we're highly encouraged by him. I think it was a good start. Here's what I don't like. This is me saying what I don't like about Fangio's quote here. Hopefully, he says, we'll be able to keep him active. We'll see how it shakes out here. Close quote. So, Zach, maybe that's gamesmanship. Maybe it's delusion. Maybe it's just simply he and the coaches haven't had a chance to discuss it. But he, they got to find a way to keep him on the field. Regardless, you got to dress him. I don't if Fant's healthy or not, and you know, work, find a way to weave him into into the game plan. It's looking like he just wants to kind of challenge him through the media. It sounds like don't give him anything, make him earn that role. He'll dress him, he'll play him. But it, it, when you drop a touchdown pass in your first game, you, you don't make a good impression on Vic Fangio. If he would have caught that, he'd be singing a much different tune. That's true. Uh, Smouse in the house. Everyone knows Z Dub Designs, superstar in this community. And Thank you, Zach. Mount Rushmore. As he says here, hashtag, let him hate, baby. Locke is such a good quarterback. He's confident and energetic. I truly believe in Locke. He's really improving. And we're right there with you, man. Like there's, I, again, I've seen nothing from Locke that makes me doubt the same things we were saying to you on the doorstep of this season before the injury bug just took a huge chunk out of this team, including from Locke. Uh, Malachi Smith jumping in. Thank you, my friend, Thank for you. the super chat. And make sure you reach out and connect with us on Twitter. And if we are already connected for what it's worth, Make sure we know who you are because oftentimes the handles are different on Twitter than they are on YouTube. Reach out and let us know. He says, <clears throat> I'm a huge Mizzou and Broncos fan, so naturally I'm biased when it comes to Drew Locke. Do you think he should be in the gun more? And Because that's where he was for four years. It just seems like he's more comfortable there. Yeah, I mean, the problem is you can't live and die in the gun in the right. NFL. Right. You have to be able to play from under center if you want to pose a plausible threat to the defense that you're going to have, uh, you know, a, a threat to run and rush the ball. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why the Broncos were drawn to Pat Shermer is he is a lot more of a gun guy than Skangs was, um, you know, last year. But I haven't really been too concerned about him, like his dropbacks and his footwork is very much improved over what it was last year in terms of the smoothness of his drop back and all that stuff. It just really, at this point, Zach, it just comes down to he needs more time on task and he needs more time with these receivers and his supporting cast to build chemistry. Yeah, very well said. He will get his reps and shotgun. It's just what his bread and butter is. But I actually take the opposite uh, thinking here. The Broncos need to run more play action. I was screaming for it yesterday in the red zone. Something underneath, a quick hitter to Lindsay out of the backfield. Something in the flats. Maybe when Melvin Gordon comes back, they'll run more play action. But they need to change it up and not make a lock a one-dimensional quarterback because that also subjects him to hits. When the defense knows he's in the gun, he's going to pass 90% of the time. I want the Broncos to have a little more mystery to their offense. So I I actually want to see him more under center, more play action, a little more razzle dazzle than just straight shock on every single snap. Yeah, like there was a play in the red zone on Sunday. Okay, uh, if I'm not, it was either the it was either the third down miss to Jerry Judy that was on lock. It was high, and and it was one of the few misfires in the first half that Locke had. And it was that one was more of a throwaway than anything, or it might have been the second of Okue Boonham's drops in the in the end zone, but. They ran an empty. They started him in the gun on like the six yard line. And then they ran, they, they motioned Lindsay out wide and just telegraphed, we're going to throw. And I just don't understand the strategy behind that. I'll be frank with you for Pat Shermer. The queen jumping in with a very generous super chat. We love you, Christy. Appreciate you so much. She says, we will get better. Drew and the team need more consistent play. They did well and they will get even better. Grit, grind, and a win is a win. Love my team. Drew is my quarterback. Love. Thanks, guys. Great job. Really appreciate that. <clears throat> it just, look, if I were to critique, and it's not that I just want to completely blow smoke up anyone's skirt here with regards to, you know, heaping praise on Drew Locke that is undeserved. There were things he needs to improve on. And a lot of it, though, guys, is making sure fans have realistic expectations. Again, eighth career NFL start. He needs to get better reading the field. He needs to get better uh, in terms of reading the defense and recognizing blitz and all that stuff. And then when the chips are down and in the clutch from a game manager perspective, he just needs to have a better feel, Zach, for for the right move, you know, for the right thing to do and not and not put your team in a in a bad situation. But Zach, that's where the coaches really let him down yesterday. Yes, but you talk about setting expectations. How many Broncos fans thought they were going to win that game? I mean, even the odds odds makers, they were nine-point underdogs when the Patriots team was hurting like they were. So 
Those same Broncos fans that were complaining they weren't going to win, now that they won, they're nitpicking Drew Locke's performance. Leave it to Christie to be the voice of reason here. I mean, who are you guys rooting for? The name on the front of the jersey or the back of the jersey? And I know it's very cliche, but uh, you have to not look at the player, look at the whole performance. Locke did enough to help the Broncos beat the Patriots. And not only beat them, beat them pretty handily. If that was Brett Rippon starting, would they have won that game? If that was Case Keenum? Blake Bortles, Jeff Driscoll. No, Locke just brings something different to the table. But again, we don't even have to waste our breath too much on it, Chad, because we both know, we're both very confident in saying he will show that, no doubt about it. He will leave that in the box score very, very soon. Yep. Bobby, jumping in. Really appreciate that generosity. Wow. Bobby, wow. You. Means a lot to us. You know how important you are and all of our superstars in this community. It just means the world to us. And support like this really does allow Zach and I to continue bringing you guys this content. And it also gives us the opportunity to think of other ways to break this team down and give you good content, solid analysis, and more on your Broncos. So thank you, Poppy. She says, it feels good to get back uh, to get back-to-back wins. We wouldn't get a W without Locke versus the Patriots. Number three will only get better. Thank you guys for all you do. Go Broncos. And that's, that's just a message that we have to echo here. And real right. quick, Zach, I want to shout out here to Ray Lynn, to her dad, Justin and Ray Lynn. Shout out to you guys. Justin, everyone should remember Justin. He longtime listener, superstar in the community. Things going on with his with his life and demands of you know the grind and making money and jobs and all that stuff. Don't allow him to be in the stream every single night or as often as he would prefer. But he's listening to every pod. He's supporting the cause. He's rocking his his football priest hat. He's rocking his his face mask. So shout out to Raylan. Shout out to Justin. And let's grab Muhammad here. Good to see you, Muhammad. Thanks Thank you, for coming in and for the support. He says, beating the Chiefs is the litmus test. Zach, beating the Chiefs is the ultimate litmus test to really kind of figure out where the Broncos are. But I think beating the Patriots on the road was also a pretty significant Mm -hmm. litmus test in and of itself. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that was a litmus test for the coaching, but I think this would be a litmus test for the players, for the defense. It's one thing to contain Cam Newton coming off the CV list. It's quite another to contain Patrick Mahomes, Le'Veon Bell now, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey. This is the litmus test for the players. If they can go in there to back to Denver and – not even beat, let's say, but take it to the Chiefs, take it down to the wire, force the Chiefs to leave everything on the field, or conversely, if Law goes toe-to-toe with Mahomes, that would leave me with a passing grade for that test. It doesn't have to be an A. It can be a B, it can be a B-, minus. it can be a C+, plus. but they have to pass this test one way or the other. Well said. We got BG, as we like to call him here, Brian Greenfield, wow, jumping Brian. in with an extremely generous super chat. Thank there you, my is. brother. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Long-time listener. Longtime superstar and one of the first when we started doing these live streams, taking the pod from an uploaded pre-recorded pod to a live stream that was there and supporting the cause. So thanks, BG. He says, all BS aside with odds, do you think we honestly, all BS aside, what odds I think is what he's saying, do you think we honestly have this week versus KC? I didn't get to see the game living on the East Coast, but that second pick locked through uh, to Patrick and double coverage was bad, but more worried. I'm more worried about Judy's drops than anything. So first and foremost, the odds, you know, I'm not sure yet. We'll have, we'll have to check with sportsbetting.com on the odds when, when they come out here in the nine next and a half so. points. It's nine and Davis. a half. Okay. So nine and a half, nothing new for the Denver Broncos, right? Overcome a nine point spread and whatnot. Look, this Bronco, this, this Broncos team proved that they're comfortable playing with house money. They're ready to roll. And it's going to be fun to see whether or not, they can really rise to the test. I'm really digging the energy right now, Zach. And Same. seeing the the Vic Fangio uh, victory speech and the game ball, for those of you who missed it, go to milehighhuddle.com, check the community section. You'll see that post with the video. I'm just really digging that energy and the vibe this team has. Again, when you have your quarterback back under center, all things are possible. And that's not me right now on, on a Monday predicting a win against the Chiefs. That's me saying that right now if you're a Broncos fan – you should feel comfortable going into this game that it's going to be a game. Yeah, I, Chad, I wish we can charge the second interception to Pat Shermer. There was no business calling that play, having him throw deep in that situation. That was not Drew Locke's fault. He doesn't make that decision. He takes the marching orders. That was all on Pat Shermer. You can nitpick the first interception, but even so, again, the Broncos won that game. And 
Take away the box score. Take away the tangible. You saw, and, and disagree with us or me if, if you think I'm wrong here, but you saw a different Broncos team. Not just on de- not, not on defense, not on specials, but just on offense alone. More energy, more fight, more want to. Having Lindsey back helped, yeah. But it was Drew Locke being under center. He, like you saw last year, filling in for Brandon Allen, he comes in and just is something different. He just has this different energy, this different vibe. You can't replicate it. You can't buy it. You can't try to create it you either have it or you don't and Locke has it it's time for Broncos country to embrace that because that same energy to go along with his arm talent and the tangibles will win the Broncos more and more games and then no Broncos fan is going to turn around and say well he should have done this should have done that when he throws for 300 yards and four touchdowns that's all Drew Locke this is the overtime podcast network <laughs> For what it's worth, I do think most Broncos fans, the vast majority of Broncos fans are on the lock train and we're completely stoked to get him back in the saddle and over the moon with the win. It's that vocal minority that is just sticking in our craw a little bit. Mike Evans, everyone knows him, bona fide superstar, great guest on the show. We've yes. had him on twice now. We'll have him on again. Jumping in. Thank you, Mike. Thank Love you, Mike. You, our offensive line is playing better. True. What is driving the positive change? Zach, more than anything, you know, we, we use that phrase again, time on task. You know, this is a new collection of guys, and it's going to take a, – there's a little uploading, a little buffering period for these guys all getting on the same page, getting up to speed. But, Zach, the quintessential linchpin moment was when DeMar Dotson replaced Elijah Wilkinson at right tackle. And, frankly, you know, that's just been the right combination, and it always was. I don't know, other than money, what was what was coloring the Broncos' thoughts on that leading into – uh, all those just – it's neither here nor there. But I honestly think, Zach, more than anything, it's the influence of, of course, Mike Munchak. But it's having the right guys and more time on task. I think you'll see continued improvement from Graham Glasgow. I think Lloyd Cushenberry had a much better game yesterday against the Patriots. Mm-hmm. Unfortunate to see Reisner have a shoulder injury. We don't know quite yet what the what the word is on that. I'll double-check Fangio's quotes. But um, Schlotman played pretty well in his his – Stead there at left guard when when Reisner had to leave, or as I should say from Trent Green, Risner, Dalton Risner, yeah. Delton Risner. It's like, come on, dude. Can you wear your Chiefs hatred of the Broncos on your sleeve <laughs> anymore, Trent Green? Anyway, so that's my take, Zach, is that it's, it's the right guys playing, uh, you know, it's the right combination of guys. They have an enunciation guide right underneath them. They can't, he can't just look at it and, and say it correctly, but that's a whole other story. The low hanging fruit here is Mike Munchak. And of course, his influence is finally paying off on this offensive line. But I'm going to say Garrett Bowles from a mental standpoint, a psychological standpoint, him turning around his entire career and becoming a very stable force of left tackle, the best Broncos lineman. I, I literally cannot believe I'm saying these words right now, but he is by far the best Broncos lineman. And I think it just has a domino uh, transitional effect on the rest of the Broncos lineman. They all are playing as one because they see that even if the, even the weakest link the blackest sheep on that offensive line can turn it around. Why can't we all? Why can't we be better? And I just think his influence and his turnaround, I think, has sparked them from maybe more so from a mental standpoint, emotional, psychological. But there's no coincidence that the offensive line is playing better. Like you mentioned, DeMar Dotson, but also his bookend, Garrett Bowles, phenomenal. Playing at, uh, you know, I said it the last week and a half or so, I'll, I'll uh, piggyback on verbiage Eric Trickle was using in his grades article near elite I mean he's playing at an elite level as Garrett Bowles right now and I'm you know what I'm no longer on eggshells on the topic like I think this is play that is here to stay that we can count on like it's been consistent Mm. it's been steady from Garrett Bowles I'm there I'm there and I might end up having to eat crow on it but that's why I'm saying pay the man get it done he deserves it you went through the 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 pain and suffering of his as an organization and as a fan base here um as he you know the proverbial face palm moments and all that pain and suffering. You finally are reaping the rewards. Pay the guy. King Kirk jumping in. Good to see you, my friend, and a name we don't recognize. So welcome and thank you for the support. Locke is the future, and soon the world will know that. That's right. Let them hate, baby. You're absolutely right, Kirk. They will see. Mr. Boggins, everyone knows Boggins. We've had him on the show. Superstar in the community. Thank you. Appreciate you, dog. He says, Locke is... Locke's multiple drop passes. Locke was multiple dropped passes away from a solid stat day. He's awesome. also better in the pocket. Side note, love the new blitzing yes. Fangio schemes. Same. Undoubtedly, Zach Fangio has said, look, you know, 
I've got to figure out a new method. The I don't have Von Miller. I don't, you know, I got I got to do something different. That zero blitz, man, on the on the fourth yeah. down play against or you know Patriots final play. That was just. I loved seeing that confidence that Fangio put on his on his blitzers, on his guys, and then also on his coverage guys. You can feel Fangio's cashews just drop on that play, Chad. It took massive ones, massive grapefruits to send the house on the game defining play. And, uh, yeah, I, I love the, I, this is the Vic Fangio I thought we were getting when the Broncos hired him. He played a lot more zone than I thought he'd play, a lot more off coverage. And it was so maddening. I was literally screaming at my computer or the TV to blitz more, not just Alexander Johnson, not just Josie Jewell, send some safety, send some corners. They're finally doing that. And there's no surprise. The defense has looked a lot better and also. Bradley Chubb's resurgence has coincided with Fangio sending more pressure. So I love aggressive Vic. I hope we never see conservative Vic ever again. Well said. Appreciate the super chat here, Chase. Good to see you. Superstar <laughs> in the community. Hashtag our, get off chat. Force. That's our next I was trying to find a way to say it without, um, you know, using expletives and cussing and whatnot. And that was, I think the best way to articulate the message. Thank you, Chase. Um, Steve Griffith, shout out to you, my friend. Good to see you. Superstar and also Facebook supporter. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, John, the stream for me just did a massive, massive jump. Kenneth Sims. And while I'm on the topic, we'll grab Kenneth Sims here in a bit. Um, JFig Vids, we missed two Super Chats yesterday. JFig Vids and Kenneth Booker. Far be it from us, you know, we, we strive not to miss any Super Chats on a live stream. And it was just so hot and heavy last night. A couple did slip through the cracks. So, Kenneth, J Fig, we love you. We apologize for missing your supers, and we will make it up to you. You, we'll keep an eye out. If you got anything on your mind tonight, you say the word, and we will find a way to make it up to you. Let's grab the Kenneth Sims jumping in. A name I don't recognize on super chat. So, welcome, okay. Kenneth. Thank, Thank you. you, my friend. Why does Deshaun keep getting snaps? They should give them to Tyree Cleveland and Zach. Was this the game? In your opinion, was this the game where? Zach Azani just gives up the ghost on Deshaun and says, I can't keep going to bat for this cat when the chips are down and he gets his opportunities. He's dropping the ball. He's not showing up for his team. He's coming up small. Do you expect to see a change there with Tyree receiving more of an opportunity? Well, that's presupposing that it's Zach Azani making that call as if it was Pat Shermer making the call on Elijah Wilkinson versus, you know, Vic Fangio or even John Elway. If, if Elway's, forceful about making something out of Deshaun Hamilton. He's not going to be off the field. I would rather play anyone, Tyree Cleveland included, over Deshaun. I, it has to be. He's given less and less effort every single game. It was a maybe he could have dove for this ball, could have dove for that ball, could have ran faster, but there's no excusing his miscue yesterday. He literally let the ball not even get through on his hands on it. It hit off his chest. It was a, if not a touchdown pass, a very long gain that would have set the Broncos up. So if this isn't the last straw, you have to question what the Broncos are thinking with DeMar Dotson, now with Nigel Bradham. If he can't get on the field now, you know, now Josh Watson's out for the year or has an injury. What is the personnel decision? What is the management? What is the determining factor for a player getting playing time? That's what I want to know. All right. Amen. Amen, my friend. All right. We are coming up on it close and we have to keep tonight's stream a little bit sharper in terms of time. So Zach, we have some supers to get to. Let's rapid fire through these, give our superstars the love and support and answers and, and, yes. you know, absolution that they deserve. Um, because I know you've got some things cooking here tonight. So BG jumping back in to say, thank you. Thank BG. You. He says, I agree, Zach pay Shelby, Lindsay Sutton, let Justin Simmons, uh, overrated behind go. I'm not quite ready to say let Justin Simmons go. He he's rede- he redeemed himself somewhat. I was getting worried about him. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I was starting to get alarmed, but he played well yesterday. Second on the team, eight tackles, all solo. Had that tip pass that Callahan picked off. So he if he can keep playing like that, that's the Justin Simmons that we saw last year, not the Justin Simmons of the first quarter of this season. Right. It, it's way too premature with so much season left to be played. What they're going to do with Justin Simmons to say what they're going to do. He's still not to me a $15 million a year safety, but he was playing like a $7 million a year safety the first three, four weeks. L- yesterday, he played like a 10 or $11 million a year safety. So yeah, it was his best game. It's not saying much because he's been pretty lousy this year. I'm not breaking the bank on Justin Simmons, but I'm not letting him walk either. I'm still waiting to see what his value should be at the end of the season. Naj Altaf jumping in, been so consistent lately. Has Naj really appreciate you, man? Yeah, You've become you, a bona fide superstar. So, really, really appreciate your support, Naj. And 
I think the time has come that you should reach out, send a, an email to Zach and myself, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. Let us send you out a shirt in a small thank you for how just outgoing your support has been on Super Chat, my friend. So reach out to us. We'll just need your shirt size and your, your uh, address, and we'll get that out to you. He says, hello, brothers. The Broncos played with tremendous confidence, which I attribute to Locke leading the way. They overcame critical errors late to win a game they would have lost in recent years. Broncos fans, be happy is what he said. So I agree, man. I agree. And that was one of the things. It's like, look, it's one thing to go on the road, Zach, and win ugly at the Jets. It's an other completely different conversation to go on the road and win ugly at the Patriots. That's when you know you're, you've are got something cooking. And you, based on some of the Broncos fans' reaction, you think they prefer to lose pretty rather than win ugly. Listen to Nas. He knows what he's talking about here. Be happy regardless of how the stat line looked or the box score looked. They went into Gillette and dominated the Patriots for 57 minutes and upset them. That is the main point, period, point blank. The wizard in the hizzy. Mundungus jumping in, bona fide superstar. Good to see you, brother. Oh, awesome. We got the real one. Oh, wait. Is that a separate one? No, this is a separate one, John. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, two of them. So we'll get them both. So I'll grab this one, then we'll grab the other one from Mike. Uh, appreciate you, dog. He says, people in here acting like Locke is the second coming of Jamarcus Russell. Good Lord. Calm down. Word. I'm with you on that, my friend. John, throw that other one up. Let's see what else he says. And this game was missing one thing, a shovel pass <laughs> to the butt. Yeah, in the clutch or on, on the one, right? Yeah, well, we got a long bomb after Locke throws a pick. So that was just – there's always one Pat Shermer head scratcher, and that was it yesterday. Um, we got one here. There's another one from Mundungus that I'm going to grab in just a second. But first, I got to grab this one from Gio, who is uh, showing some support. Love you, buddy. He says, really appreciate the super. He says, watching live tonight, Locke is our future. Just got to give him time to get in his groove. Bowles is a beast. Now, I'll agree with you on that. I picked a nit with you when you said that about Okaway Boonham, but I'm going to agree with you right now. Bowles is a beast. As I said, all offseason, sign him up. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Amen, my friend. It's good to have you in the stream. He is a beast this year, but the thing for me with Bowles, I'm still waiting for him to turn into that werewolf at any given moment, Chad, for the moon to be shining a certain way or the sun. You know, you always wait for that Garrett Bowles miscue to rear its ugly head. And to his credit, through this point, we haven't seen any. And Dungus again. Appreciate you, brother. He says, by the way, Zach, you didn't knock on wood and look at what and look at what happened. It's you know what? It could have been worse. So I uh, my jinx powers were defenseless against the Broncos yesterday. All right, we got one here coming in from uh, the great and phenomenal and funny and long suffering Mark Langley. Love you, buddy. Superstar MHH Mount Mark. Rushmore guy. Good to see you in the stream, buddy. He says, What's up, guys? Let them hate. And that is a message that we have imparted to the community now go, dating back. Zach, you coined that, I don't know, during the offseason at some point, but it's never been more apropos. Yeah, right after, uh, not Adam Rank, who was it? Uh, Nick Wright. Right after he came yeah. out and, and gave the record prediction, I said, you know what, let him hate, the Broncos will be better. And, and It's still the same message. The mantra never went away. And especially after yesterday's win, when people are still criticizing Locke and the Broncos, let them hate, because they will see. All right, we got DA Dub, Discount Audio and Wheels, longtime listener, bona fide superstar. Appreciate you, you, my friend. He says, okay, yes, he is. Let me get to the I gotta read this whole thing because it won't show up. He's five and two, Lock is removing the pit game. But remove his best game versus the Texans. And what do you have? Bottom of the pack quarterback firing uh, a bottom of the pack quarterback. Firing Skangs really did not help his development. Can't help watching other QBs ball Pat Shermer so far is disappointing. Um, you know, that's like saying, here's the thing, Dub. you know, I love you, but that's like saying in week four, all right, Melvin Gordon gets his first hundred yard rushing game as a Bronco. And you say, well, well, hold on. If you take away that 43 yard rush at the end where he scored, he doesn't even get to, you know, 60 yards, but you did, he did though. You can't take it away. That's what he did. So here's, here's my message to you, DA Dub. It was his eighth start. Okay. Soak it in. Enjoy it. He's going to continue to get better. And, you know, if you want to consider that a bold prediction at this point, by all means, that's fine. 
you want to count the Pittsburgh game, he's still five and three. If you want to discount the Texans game, he's still four and two. He still has a winning record. He still went into New England and helped the Broncos upset the Patriots. So you can slice and dice it. You can rationalize. You can justify. You can nitpick and hem and haw. The, the, the fact of the matter is a win is a win and the Broncos won largely on the strength of what Locke did yesterday, interceptions aside. We got Chris Hernandez jumping in. Everyone knows him, 24-year veteran of the Air Force, bona fide superstar, and definitely up there on the MHH Mount Rushmore. Reminding everybody, click those little thumbs up. Really appreciate you, my friend, as always. So consistent every single stream. He's here, and he's showing love, not only on YouTube as a, as a Super Chat superstar, but he's also a supporter on Facebook. Much love to you, my friend. Uh, Eddie Vasquez, jumping in again. This is two nights in a row. Great to see you, my friend. Thank you, Eddie. Just saying, hey, love y'all, and thanks for another pod. We love you too, my friend. All right, we got uh, another one here from Glenn, and then we're getting a little bit closer to caught up here. And by the way, Zach, if at any point you do need to dip, just say the word, and you know we can. I'll, I can finish off tonight's stream, but um, we're getting closer here. We leave no superstar on the outside looking in. Glenn Hauser again, superstar. Love you, bro. Thank you, Glenn. Even Lynn Manuel Miranda wants us to bench <laughs> Hamilton. Do we need to remind people we won on the road as 10 point underdogs after 17 days? Hashtag go away. Funny. Very funny and very well put. That's that's true. That's true on multiple levels there, Glenn. Um, we got DA Dub coming back in here. Let me just get it in the on the card here. Appreciate the support, man, and the generosity. He says. Still with Locke, need, still with Locke, he needs time to develop, but I can't get mad at the fan base watching other young quarterbacks lighting up the NFL. It's hard to be patient, though. Go Broncos. Also good to see Philip Lindsay 30 running the ball. Yeah, the thing to, to keep in mind is, and I'd be curious to know who exactly you're talking about. I mean, are you talking about Justin Herbert, who has yet to win a game? Are you talking about Kyler Murray, who's had the benefit of starting every single game since he arrived in the league? Are you talking, I mean, Daniel Jones, he's not lighting it up. Who exactly, I mean, Joe Burrow, who specifically are you talking about? Because, Haskins. yeah, Pat, Patrick Mahomes, yeah, <laughs> Dwayne Haskins. Patrick Mahomes, he, yeah, he's a young quarterback, but he's not in the same category as those guys. I mean, he he proved in his first year as a starter that he's on another level. Same with Lamar Jackson. I'd be curious, DA Dub, and I'm serious about this. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, shoot me an email, milehighhuddle at gmail.com. I'm curious to know exactly what quarterbacks you are talking about. And also keep in mind, Patrick Mahomes went through his struggles in his first year. He had his his hiccups as well. Lamar Jackson, his first year as an NFL quarterback, he literally couldn't throw the football. All he did was run. It takes time for young quarterbacks in this league to transition, especially when, again, you're not a perfectly shiny prospect. You're not a game manager. You're a gunslinger who makes plays like a like in a backyard football game. That's what Drew Locke is. That's what Mahomes is. That's what Tony Romo was. They all needed time and consistency. And if you give Drew Locke both of those things, he will blossom into a quarterback, hopefully, of that caliber. We got Dustin T. Lavar, Lavari, jumping in, a name we don't recognize, but thank you, my friend. Thank and you, Dustin. Dustin. Be sure to reach out and connect with us on Twitter. He says, notice how Lindsey's 100-yard game seemed legit. Unlike Gordon. So this kind of speaks to that thing I said where you take away the 43-yard rush against the Jets, it's not a hundo. It was a, I will give you this, it was a more consistent performance from Lindsay. So in that sense, yes, it was more legit. He was consistent front to back through the whole game. He was a steady, consistent force for the Broncos. And it took a lot of pressure off lock. It forced the the Patriots on their heels quite a bit more. They had to consider the run, the pass. And honestly, you know, it was a big reason why the Broncos were able to have six scoring possessions. And granted, None of them were touchdowns. We've already we've already mined that that earth in particular, Zach. That woulda, shoulda, coulda. There should have been at least three touchdowns on the board. But nevertheless, Lindsey, you got to be stoked with what you saw with him coming back. What was I know he went over a hundred, but what was his yards per carry average? It was it was four, basically four point four. That's very solid for a guy who's quote unquote not a workhorse running back, not a three down running back. That was a workman like performance, a workman like a hundred yard game. He can do it all. He is the Broncos' best running back. And if they actually throw to him like they were doing to Melvin Gordon, he will make even more plays. This offense will be 
infinitely more explosive now that Philip Lindsay's back and coming off the turf toe, that's an injury attached to his toe. He's a running back and that's his first game back. He had a hundred yards. What more does number 30 have to do to earn the respect of not only the Broncos, but the fan base? I don't get it. It's a mystery. It really is. But I think uh, eventually, like he said, you know, it's very, you gotta, you gotta get through me basically. And it's very hard to do. He proved that yesterday, the injury bug, Sidelined him temporarily, but he's back with gusto. Kenneth Booker, there he is. Good to see you, brother. Appreciate the support. Thank you. And Good again, point, sorry, sorry we missed your uh, super last night. Favorite part of the game, the lack of punts. Yeah, the Broncos didn't punt till w- deep into the second half and only punted twice. So, yeah, that's, awesome. again, six scoring drives. You want touchdowns, but, hey, it was enough to come out with the dubs, Zach. Yeah, you would never know based on the yards and the first downs and how explosive the Broncos offense looked at times that they only had, you know, only the points they had with two punts. But it's encouraging, again, when you have an offense that gets their franchise quarterback back, that gets their best running back back, you don't have to punt the football. You can have drives that sustain, drive to take time off the clock, move down the field. The only criticism, you want to end those drives in the end zone, not with field goals. But other than that, two punts, I'll take that any day. Drew H., Buy some swag, a.k.a. Drew Hollenbeck. Appreciate the plug, my friend. Thank you. Love you, buddy, and appreciate your support. He says, I want Hamilton off this team. Give Tyree Cleveland a shot. I think you're inching closer to that reality, but until we see it on the field, uh, in reality, you know, until we see it with our own eyes, it's, it's going to be hard to, to know for sure. I want to address this from Kenneth since, you know, we did miss one of his supers yesterday. They treated Michael O like Fant. Tons of targets in the first half, forgot about him in the second. The one thing I'll say, though, Kenneth, is that one big difference is he really didn't capitalize on those recept- those target opportunities, three of which were in the end zone. And so I have to go back and specifically watch the second half coverages to see if it was something different the Broncos did or if it was something different the Patriots did. But I don't – if it ended up being something different the Broncos did, I don't necessarily, Zach, blame Locke blame Shermer for maybe going away from him a little bit in the second half, just because Locke fed him, dude. Locke went into that going, Hey, we're going to rekindle some Mizzou magic here. You ready? Let's go, dude. And he, he fed him. He force fed him and he threw some dimes to him, gave him multiple yeah. opportunities to score touchdowns. And he only ended up with two receptions on six targets. Three of those four targets that he didn't haul in dropped touchdowns. You guys remember that Noah Fant touchdown in the opener in the end? I mean, that, that caught that pass that he caught from Drew Locke, he had to make an adjustment to. If that same pass uh, yesterday went to Noah Fant, that would have been a touchdown. He will get better with experience. I like, though, that at least Shermer, with his biggest criticism coming out of week one, he went away from Noah Fant. He completely ghosted him. At least he's recognizing where the, where the Broncos' bread is buttered. Tough sentence to say. And also the fact that Bill Belichick shifted more attention to Albert O yesterday. He is the best game planner in the entire NFL. So he took away Albert O and made the Broncos beat him elsewhere, which they did. Albert O will get better as they go along, but I personally cannot wait for Noah Fant and Albert O on the field together in the red zone. Devastating. And once all these weapons get on the same page with a little consistency at the quarterback position, it's right. gonna it's gonna be gangbusters and it's gonna be fun to watch. Holding butts jumping in. Great handle, my friend. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you. He says, PFF gave Michael Ojemudia a grade of 88.6, which is the highest of any rookie corner this season so far. Yeah, he played great. We received – I can't remember who it was on Twitter. Uh, they were complaining that we didn't give Ojemudia enough love for his performance yesterday in our gut reaction. And I don't think we discounted him at all. He was really, really good. Two forced fumbles. Tip your cap. He's been playing really well. He's definitely not trending or traject- – his trajectory is nowhere close to being – third round bust corner like um, Langley and and Yadam. This is a dude that the Broncos are going to be able to count on. Yeah, we talked about this on yesterday's pod. He he impressed me yesterday. He was way more consistent, and I love the fact that he turns his head around and can find the football. So definitely not a bust. I think he can settle into a very high upside cornerback too in the system, and he earned that grade yesterday, I have to say. All right, we really got to rapid fire these remaining ones. Rick Mendoza, appreciate you, my friend. Thank Thank you. It was great to see Lindsay out there again. If Gordon plays this Sunday, do you think Lindsay should start over Gordon? Hashtag feed Phil. Oh, you bet your bottom dollar, Zach. He 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 never should have had to have given up starter and sharing co-starter. But in light of Gordon getting the Dewey, absolutely that that benefit of the doubt is gone. And Phillip comes back, gets a hundred on the road against Belichick in Gillette Stadium. He should be the man. 
Yeah, I mean, you can talk about possibly Melvin Gordon being Wally Pipped. And not an injury, just his own incompetence and his own error getting the DUI. Philip Lindsay, for my money, I know it's a very contentious uh, opinion to have. He is the better running back, and yeah, he will be the nominal starter against the Chiefs. Whatever Melvin Gordon does, he does. But Philip Lindsay will not relinquish that role, I think, anytime soon. All right, I'm looking here to see if there is an update on Reisner. I'm not. I'm not seeing it. There's a Vic in the stream. I don't see it for what it's worth. From what Vic Fangio said today, uh, Justin Martin jumping in. Thank you, my friend. Thank Good you. to see you again two days in a row. I know for a fact that we have the potential to beat the Chiefs this weekend. Locke will just have to keep getting better and better. Yeah, I mean, definitely the potential is there. And I love the energy and I love the, the mindset. They're playing with house money. And, you know, they could, they could do some damage here. You play when – if you play like you have nothing to lose, a lot of times good things can happen. Yeah, and that's what I like. The Broncos were playing very loose yesterday, and they were playing with a different energy, and that stems from having some time off, even though they practiced, but also getting their quarterback back. And when they had that mentality, and this is what I was, this is what spawned Let Him Hate. When they have the mentality that it's them against the world, that's when they shine their best. And you can sense they were very disrespected by the rescheduling, by getting Cam Newton back and uh, the spread for the game and everyone picking the Patriots. They felt disrespected and slandered, and they came out with the energy to to disprove that. And if we get that same energy going forward, they're going to stack some wins this season. Trust me. There he is. Um, hold on one sec, John. Keep Chad right there. Keep Chad right there. I just want to say this, this is uh, Justin. You can see. This is a casual pick. He's out with his woman, and he's taking a pick. He's got that the podcast hat on. He's got his MHH uh, mask on. So love you, bro. And check out his YouTube channel. Shout out to him, Slim the Tech Guy Gamer. Go give him a sub. I'm taking notes. Y'all are killing it. Facts. Hashtag MHH for life. Thank you, Thank buddy. You. All right, John, throw that one back up. Sorry, my friend. Uh, the Chad04 jumping in again. Thank you, bro. How about giving some love to Brandon McManus B Money? Kudos to the special teams coach. Right, Zach? Hashtag no. Chad's rule. <laughs> no, no, that's not Tom McMahon. That is all McManus. I'm not giving McMahon any credit. BMAC, yeah, he justified that contract. McMahon, he can still kick rocks. John, do you have King Kirk? The other King Kirk one here. If not, I'll throw it on. Where, man, I didn't realize how many more awesome supers had stacked up here. So, again, Zach, if you do have to dip, you you dip. Yeah, and- I've, I've, I'm not missing much. It's 14 nothing Cardinals. So Okay. Ooh, yikes. All right, here we go. Yeah. From uh, – Whoops, I almost typoed this. From King Kirk, jumping in. Thank you again, my friend. As a true Broncos fan, I'm ready for a shootout this coming Sunday against Pat Mahomes. This is the head-to-head I've been waiting to see for years to come. And, yeah, I mean, last year we we were all excited to see that, but it ended up being a weird snow game in an extremely hostile environment. So definitely looking forward to seeing how this this QB head-to-head shapes up. Yeah, And then we got Kobe. K.O. B- Cobsters? Cobsters? Appreciate that super chat, my friend. Really means a lot to us. Um, let's see, John. We got uh, BG again and another Cobsters. Cobsters? BG, love you, buddy. Will AJ Bouye be back this week? And what do you guys uh, What do you guys think of the rookie DB play so far? OJ Mudia has been money in the bank. You know, saying Bassey, they had to go away from him because, you know, he just – once you once they realize the right combo that they need, Callahan – Bosby and uh, Ojemudia on the field until Bouye gets back. That's just the best combo. And, you know, Bassey's learning as he goes. To answer your question, though, Zach, for uh, Bouye, here's what Fangio said, quote, this week there will be a chance for Fant. There will be a chance for Hamler. There will be a chance for Bouye. I think those are the main ones from last week that didn't partake. So good chance. Oh, and here's what he did say about uh, Reisner. They're still doing work on him and Deontay Spencer, we hope to have more confirmation later today. This was earlier on Monday on both of them, and maybe something's come out on Twitter since then. Both of them may or may not miss time right now. We really have inconclusive info at this point. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged real quick, though. The, the better that Michael Lowe plays, I think it can allow the Broncos to ease back in Boye to the fold. They're not going to push them if they get competent play from Callahan, which they're getting, Bosby, and also Michael Lowe. So uh, it's a good problem to have for Denver. Copesters jumping in again. Appreciate you, my friend. Can you imagine when Locke and Alberto get in sync? Gonna be amazing. Yeah. And I think that's the one, one of the positive takeaways that you should hold on to as fans from yesterday with regard to Locke, with regard to Alberto, is they have an obvious chemistry and connection there. And as they exactly, as, as, as time marches on and 
They get more time on task together in this scheme. I mean, the rust was falling off in chunks yesterday, Zach, for both those guys. So, yeah, it's it's exciting. And that ties right into the Wizards question here again. Thanks, Mundungus. Any chance we see more of a two tight end set with Albert Owen Fant and just keep two wideouts on the field in order to also keep Hamilton off the field? I do think that uh, you, what you saw from that, and it wasn't even so much how great um, Albert O was, but just how strong that connection was between Locke and Albert O. I do think you'll see more than you've seen traditionally from Pat Shermer offenses with regard to two tight end sets. Zach. If you want Hamilton off the field, you better hope KJ Hamler gets gets better really fast because it's not it's tight end to receiver. It's, it's apples and oranges. Uh, the longer that Hamler's out, they're going to have to lean on Deshaun Hamilton. The other alternative is, is playing Tyree Cleveland, which I'm fine with, but obviously someone on the Broncos coaching staff still wants to squeeze and try to bleed the rock known as Deshaun Hamilton. Flipping Booch jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, Jerry Judy wasn't used right. Run a slant with him, and that's true. I agree with you that, you know, they need to be – they need to recognize his strengths a little bit more and try and play to those as he's building up confidence as a rookie. And I, I was begging for that in the red zone, something underneath, either a quick hitter to Lindsey or Judy or, or Albert O, something to give a, a playmaker the ball in their hands, let them do something with it. So I agree with that comment wholeheartedly. Richie Rich jumping in up in Canada. Appreciate you, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you. He says, I'd like to see Denver get a larger running back. I believe this would help us in the red zone. Thoughts? Hashtag freaking eh. I'm a Bron- <laughs> freaking A. I'm a Broncos fan. Yeah, I mean, that's what Gordon's supposed to do for you, and I think that's what he does do for you. So once you get Gordon back, I'm not so much worried about uh, red zone running backs and short yardage as much. That They also worked out a running back today, I believe. I, I, sh- yeah, former I forgot, Mizzou, his- I forget his name now. Yeah. Former play, Mizzou teammate with Locke and, and Alberto. Uh, the Duke in the house. Good to see you, my friend. Superstar OG in the Thank house. You, dude. Locke was so rusty that only WD-40 would have loosened him up. <laughs> I ain't sweating this lackluster, his lackluster play. He'll only get better if he can stay healthy. Amen. Yep. And that's the thing to keep in mind, Zach, which should be encouraging and impressive to fans is you saw that from Locke yesterday, and he was rusty. He hadn't played for a month. It's it's common sense, and if that's the worst that Locke is going to look this season and they upset the Patriots, again, can you imagine how good they're going to be when he's on point when that rust falls off? I, I cannot wait to see it happen. All right, Mr. Castillo jumping in. Thank you, my friend. Two days in a row with you, and that really we appreciate you. He says, I know that some of the calls made by Pat are head scratchers, but how much different do we talk about them if the players make the plays they get paid to? Excellent point, and that's yes. why really football is the ultimate team sport. It's a symbiotic endeavor and you know the receivers did lock no favors in the first half nor did they do the coordinator but it's if like you mentioned chad you can talk about what if would have happened but that didn't happen we're talking about what actually did transpire so i mean again it it comes down to hypotheticals and theoreticals and we're not getting into that all right mr ronch jumping in appreciate you my friend he says the play scheme needs to be fast and crisp that's on coaching not lock the player's strength doesn't match the playbook I foresee some hot seats. You know, just some of the decision-making is what I question. And look, the Broncos now are are bottom two or three in the league in terms of red zone efficiency. If you don't improve that stat in a hurry, yeah, you're not going to have a job very long. But, Zach, I think consistency at quarterback, you're going to see Shermer kind of figure out his groove. And, Hopefully. And you just got to stay healthy. Hopefully, yeah, we don't see any more tight end shovels or running on third and fourth and two. That, that's just not a quarterback. It's not an experience. That's just a bad call from Pat Shermer. Uh, I, I was on record yesterday saying if the Broncos would have blown that game, if they would have lost, I would have fired Pat Shermer. And I still think he should be maybe not on the hot seat, but the lukewarm seat. He should be judged on a game by game basis and then determining what they want to do at the end of the year. I don't want Locke to have to learn another system, but. I don't see a huge upgrade on Scangarello. I, I, I admit incrementally, quarterback development and aggressiveness, uh, vertical football is better. But would you say, Chad, he's a no doubt about it, 100% upgrade on Scangarello? I'm not there yet. I would say that. I'm just not – I do think he's better than Skangs, but I'm not ready to crucify him yet until he gets some consistency at quarterback. Holler at me in a few more weeks when we've got a few more games with he and Locke together and – and yeah. then we can revisit that. Fair. Uh, Jay Fig jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. He yeah. says, no problem. I'm missing my super chat. Uh, yeah, thanks, brother. Really appreciate you. And sorry we missed you last night. You know, we we try to avoid that at all costs. Uh, Josh Alstrom, good to see you, my friend. PFF actually gave Locke some love this week, gave him a decent grade. 
and said big time throws were there in spite of the stats. Yeah, I mean, and that's the one thing, you know, it's it's a loser's tact to have to rely on woulda, shoulda, coulda. But the reason we're having to do that with regard to Locke tonight is to set the record straight because the Broncos won. It's unfortunate that we have to remind everybody of that, <laughs> what could have been if a few things go differently, but it was through no fault of Locke's in terms of that was first, you know, three and a half quarters. We're, I just know that we're going to get a game sooner than later where the Broncos, no doubt about it, have a resounding victory because their quarterback led them to that victory. And I just can't wait to see the comments that come in when that happens. All right. I think, John, are we caught up? I think we're caught up. Let me double check. Yeah, we're caught up. All right, guys. We'll we'll double check it on uh, after the fact and make sure we did not miss anybody, but I'm pretty sure we didn't, and we ran really long. Love you guys. Thanks to each and every one of you for spending some time with us here tonight. A mile high salute to our Super Chat superstars and our Facebook supporters. We love you guys. Make sure you are following the pod before you head on out of here. Don't forget to like the video and uh, follow the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. Follow Mile High Huddle on Twitter at Mile High Huddle. My partner, Zach Kelberman at Kelberman NFL. Myself at Chad and Jensen and John Cronenberg on Twitter at John K M H H. Check out the uh, old merch store if you're in a position to. If you're not, it's all good. Again, the biggest testimonial you guys can offer us in terms of are we doing a good job for you, share this video out there. That's how we'll know whether or not you think we're doing a good job. But, Zach, we're off tomorrow night. It'll be building the Broncos. So um, have a great start to your week, my friend, and uh, we'll, we'll reconvene Wednesday night. You as well as always. And let me just say to Broncos country, if you feel bad about the Broncos and their defense, watch this Cowboys game. It's atrocious. It's embarrassing. It can always be worse. They're about to lose this game. The Broncos won. They beat the Patriots. They have momentum going into Kansas City. Use this week to feel good about it. Revel in it. Have confidence in your team. Support your quarterback. I promise it will be okay, guys. I promise you. All right, guys, for Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. Love you. We'll see you Wednesday, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget Nick and Carl tomorrow night, though, Tuesday, building the Broncos, same time, 6 p.m. Mountain. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.